Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Upstream online event. We're going to pause here for just a moment, give people a chance to enter the webinar. Appreciate your patience in the waiting room. For those of you who can see already, I'm watching the number of participants tick up as they come in. Just a few more moments We're waiting for more people who are signing on and it's showing participants joining the webinar at the bottom of my screen, probably yours too. Hello, Charlie Quinn. I just saw you raised your hand. Thank you for doing that. Now, lots of people are raising their hands. Cool. We just crossed the threshold of 400. As I understand, we have um, sold uh, over 750 tickets already this evening. So I think pe people will continue to join, but let's go ahead and, and begin, uh, especially because here in the beginning, I just have some technical things. Good evening and welcome to Upstream. Uh, my name is Joe Mall. I'm the executive director with McKenzie River Trust, the host for tonight's program. This is a web adaptation of an event originally planned for back in March at the John G. Shedd Institute for the Arts. I really look forward to the day when we can all return to such spaces together. First, I'd like to begin with a few housekeeping pointers about Zoom webinar, the platform we're using this evening. When you entered the webinar, it automatically put you on mute and turned you off your webcam, so I can't see the, the crowd at all, which is really disorienting. Um, if you do have any technical issues, you can use the Q&A box down at the bottom and both MRT staff and a Zoom professional are online to offer help tonight. That Q&A icon is also where you can pose questions for a discussion that will follow Robin's presentation. Quest, uh, questions can be submitted at any time and we'll do our best to select a representative range for that discussion. We would like to thank Quick Caption for providing us with closed caption options. Um, if you would like to see closed captions, you can click on that button on your control panel that should be up at the top of your screen. The captions will then appear at the bottom of your screen. If you have to leave the presentation or have technical difficulties, we will be sending an email tomorrow with a link to a recording for tonight's event. Web-based broadcasts like this are really funky and clunky and frustrating at times, so we appreciate your willingness to participate through this virtual platform and your patience if that clunkiness becomes evident. This year's Upstream event is the second in what's now an annual series. Many of you were here with us last year when, Barry, uh, when writer Barry Lopez reflected on his new book, uh, Horizon. I just noticed last week at uh, two of our local bookstores, Tsunami Books and J. Michael Booksellers, that Horizon is now available in paperback. 
those two bookstores in Eugene or local bookstores, wherever you may be, are also great places to pick up copies of Braiding Sweetgrass and Gathering Moss, Robin's two marvelous reads. Let's begin by talking briefly about place. The McKenzie River Trust office, where I'm standing now, is in a place called Eugene, Oregon. That name honors a 19th century settler, Eugene Skinner, originally from the shores of Lake Champlain in New York. He and his wife, Mary, arrived in Oregon Territory in 1847 and filed a land claim and developed a profitable, and, and developed a profitable ferry service along the Willamette River. The ferry was instrumental in the settlement and subsequent economic development of this part of Oregon. What's interesting is that historical accounts note that the local indigenous people for whom this region was recognized as the Kalakuya Ilahi gave Eugene the advice to build his home far upslope on the hill, a place now known as Skinner's Butte, because of the regular flooding of the river. So fast forward 173 years to the work that many of us in the region are doing now to heal that river and our connections to it. We're coming to realize that we don't often enough heed that original good advice. The river is very much alive today and continues to challenge us when we try to settle along its banks. We also don't often enough honor the people, the Kalapuya people, the Siletz people, the Coquil, Coos, Umqua, Sayusla, Cow Creek, Grand Ron, Warm Springs, Umatilla, Paiute, Klamath, and many other people who were here at that time. We don't often recognize that their descendants who are still here today and who contribute to the welfare of what we now call Oregon, who may be equally vocal fans of Oregon ducks and Oregon state beavers. At the same time, they're maintaining the cultural traditions and spiritual connections to land and water to this place that their families practiced for thousands of years until settlement disrupted all that, often violently, often with disdain and malice. We honor the Kalapuya Ilahi on which we live and work and are thankful for the acceptance and support we receive from our partners in Native American communities as we try to better understand that disruptive history, as we try to become better upstream and downstream neighbors. We established the Upstream Event Series as a way to invite more people to consider the work of land and water conservation and its role in our communities. The Mackenzie River Trust is a land trust. That means for the last 30 years and hopefully the next 300, we can provide people a way to care for the places they call home. For us, this begins with the land and water that provide life. Life, or what a mentor to me years ago liked to describe as all the four-legged bears, two-legged bears, and everything in between. Land trusts are just one of many approaches to doing this work. One of our particular characteristics is a legal commitment to the long term. We deal with an imperfect but currently functional concept of perpetuity. That means land held in trust for public benefit forever. That can be a difficult, awkward idea forever. I think Robin has better ways of helping us consider our actions today, both backwards and forwards many generations. That's why we asked her, her to be with us today and why we chose the series title Upstream. So indeed, what does it mean to be a good neighbor? To live upstream, knowing that what I do here has an impact on what you experience there downstream. What does it mean to be a good person? living now, knowing that what I do today has an impact on people born tomorrow, downstream in time. That's the question we ask participants in the upstream events to consider. That includes speakers like Robin and Barry and you as participants in this conversation. We hope these conversations will continue long after we sign off this evening. We try to keep those questions in mind every day in all aspects of our work. Certainly our experience with COVID, the pandemic, and now with the brutal ongoing reality of racism, again, brought to light so vividly in the United States. We are considering that question in new ways. Downstream of 450 years since slavery and colonial settlement began to change this place, Turtle Island, who has benefited and who has suffered? We have a tremendous amount of work to do simply to understand the depths of those questions 
much, much less to shift that balance towards more equity and justice. I'm thankful that we have many good partners and friends with whom we do this work. I mentioned we rely on the tribes for guidance. We rely on watershed councils, soil and water conservation districts, friends groups, parks associations, government agencies, dozen, dozens of other organizations, and generous individuals like you. Thank you for the support you provide. I hope you will be encouraged and will again support us financially today, tomorrow, and for the next 300 years. Because we're not gathering, um, because we are gathering remotely, our base costs for tonight's events are well covered. Deep thanks, deep gratitude to James Coons and Mary Nyquist Coons, to Ann and Dave Fidanke, and to the Morris Morrison Family Charitable Foundation for their financial support of Upstream. Based on the consideration of Robin's call for reciprocity, generosity, and interconnectedness, as well as the call to support the efforts of Black and Indigenous groups, we've decided to redirect net proceeds from tonight's event, including any gifts that come through give at mckenzieriver.org upstream 2020, should be in the chat box soon, if not now, to support two local groups, two local efforts in the Eugene area. The first is an ongoing collaborative emerging with the Long Tom Watershed Council and others to support tribal members leading prescribed fire training in the Willamette Valley for ecological and cultural values. The second is Saturday's June, Juneteenth celebration at Alton Baker Park here in Eugene, the first set celebration for the, the emancipation of enslaved peoples since 1992. The local nonprofit Escape Dance Academy is a black owned organization found and founded and managed by Vanessa Fuller. They have been instrumental in youth leadership, including many of the leaders of the current Black Lives Matter efforts in our area. The Academy is central to the planning for the Juneteenth celebration, and we salute and support those efforts. All of us that contribute to land protection, habitat restoration, and stewardship work increasingly recognize that our history of often considering the work of nature conservation in isolation from the health and welfare of people is quite frankly a, a bit laughable when it's not so frustrating, maddening, or maybe just sad. We encourage you to listen to tonight to Robin's words and to consider how you might give back to efforts that further equity and justice in our region. You can do that with a contribution tonight at that link. If you've read Robin Kimmerer's work or heard her speak, you know how well she made beautiful, robust baskets, baskets of language that help us carry along thoughts of how we might live our lives more justly. That in her work, even when alone mucking out in the accumulated organic matter of a pond, those connections to two-legged bears and four-legged bears and everything in between are always there. So let's get to that. The weaving of those thoughts into language we can carry with us in the days ahead. To introduce Robin, however, I'd like to first welcome a leader in this work here in the Willamette Valley, of Western Oregon. Tana Ashley Culbertson is the co-director of the Willamette River Network. The network is a basin-wide collaborative committed to river health, sustainability, tribal sovereignty, environmental justice, and youth leadership development. Tana is an enrolled citizen of the Klamath tribes and grew up along the Sprague River, a tributary to the Klamath with family roots among members of the Modoc and Kurok and Paiute peoples. She studied journalism at the University of Oregon and education administration at Oregon State University. We've asked Tana and are thankful that she agreed to both welcome and introduce Robin and to join Robin for the discussion of questions you all may have after Robin's presentation. Tana. Thank you. Wakli Swad, Gawasasis Tana. Ni a Modokni Choi Numu Choi Kruk. Hello, my name is Tana Ashley Culbertson. I'm a citizen of the Klamath tribes and a descendant of the Modoc, Paiute, and Kruk peoples from Southern Oregon and Northern California. I am honored to join you this evening. I want to acknowledge that if we were meeting tonight in person, we would all have been on the ancestral homelands of the Kalapuya peoples. Instead, we're on the homelands of many tribal nations and are benefiting from their wise stewardship and knowledge of place. Being raised along an old winding river in the Klamath Basin, which is the Sprague River, <laughs> I have a unique relationship with rivers. I've always lived along one. When I was in college, I lived along the Willamette. As an adult, I still live along the Willamette, but I've also lived along the Columbia. 
Being a river person, you come to know the state of the environment around you, as well as the time of year. When there has been a good snowpack and spring comes, you know it by the rising river levels and the threat of floods. When it is summer, you know if it is a drought year or not, based on receding water lines along the river banks or the bridges that cross them. You know if things are out of balance. If in late summer there is an abundance of nutrients in the water and fish begin floating by, dead due to lack of oxygen. And you know it is really cold in the winter if the top of the river begins to freeze. As I said, you develop a relationship with the river. Recently, I began working for an emerging network of people who care about the Willamette River and all of its peoples who live within the basin. The Willamette River Network is still in its forming stages and we are very excited to begin connecting and creating an inclusive, just and equitable relationship with the indigenous peoples who have always called these spaces home, black indigenous people of color who may not have always felt the most welcome, the people who work directly on river health and restoration, those who recreate, fish, swim, kayak and boat, and everyone else who would like to be a part of shaping that shaping what we become. Our vision is to see a healthy Willamette River system where people and rivers thrive together and we invite you to connect with us in the coming weeks as we, be, as we begin to share some of our early outreach work. But tonight I have the honor of introducing our speaker. Robin Wall Kimmerer is a mother, a plant ecologist, writer and distinguished professor at the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse, New York. She is of European and Anishinaabe ancestry and is an enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. Many of you have had the pleasure of reading her books, Gathering Moss and Braiding Sweetgrass. Her unique storytelling blends her indigenous teachings and Western science to help tell the story of how to heal our relationship with our environment. It was recently shared in an indigenous women's group that I'm part of that braiding sweetgrass resonates in a way that many other books have not. Many of the women, young and old, are academics. They're also traditional food gatherers in their tribal communities. Moving away from home, even for a little while, has highlighted the differences in their observance of traditional ecological knowledge and natural law and the Western science their peers and professors adhere to. The importance of having teachers who understand both of these worlds and can translate how in some ways they might be trying to tell the same story or teach us different yet equally important lessons is so important, especially for those who have not always been validated in the academy. I wanna thank Robin personally for creating a space that values these experiences, for it is through teaching like this that bridges are built and understanding and respect can be achieved, all for the benefit of a more healthy environment for us all. Please join me in welcoming our speaker tonight, Robin Wall Kimmerer. Mo Sapketcha. Miigwech, Tana. Um, thank you for that beautiful introduction. And I'm really looking forward to the Q&A when we get a chance to talk together a little bit about the efforts that are happening um, in, in, the, in the whole watersheds of, of beautiful Oregon. Um, and thanks to all of you who are joining tonight from your living room, from your deck, from your kitchen table, wherever it is. It's so hard to sit here and imagine you, um, but um, we'll do our best to create community across this, this remote um, framework that we have together. I also have to tell you that I'm... Um, uh, sitting here in Fabius, New York, a little farm community in upstate New York, and um, it's just getting dark here, and the birds are singing like crazy, but they are sometimes joined by my neighbor's farmer's peacocks. <laughs> so if you hear these crazy shouts, right there um it, it is it is not a a, a hostage it's just the, the the peacocks so i want to begin um with a traditional um protocol greeting um i will say to you bonjour jayak shabadas ke gish ko kwe nadesh nakas bodwe wad mi kwe nda anish nabe kwe megazay do dem minwa mako do dem 
Syracuse, New York, Nidoch Bia, Shishi Banyak, Nibendigwes. In my language, I have told you what my name, that I am a Potawatomi woman of the Anishinaabe peoples. I am a member of the Eagle Clan as well as of the Bears. And uh, I am enrolled in uh, the Citizen Potawatomi Nation um, in Shawnee, Oklahoma. Um, I don't speak very much of our beautiful language by virtue of forced assimilation and a um, colonizing education system. Our language has become an endangered species, as you know, and our teachers ask us to speak it, to breathe life into it, even though we know, and in my case, very little, um, but it's important that we can hear those words and, and uh, nurture them, them back uh, to, to health. It is also our way that we always begin with gratitude when we have a gathering such as this, because we are showered daily with the gifts of the earth. If you just stop and think for a moment of everything that has come to you during this day that is just winding down, you know, the air of a, of a sweet spring evening, that pure water that you had to drink, food from fertile valley soils, the companionship of clouds and, and thrushes, the privileges of this meaningful work that we are all engaged in together, the joy of the community and doing it together. I think of gratitude for your beautiful faces, which I cannot see, um, but am imagining and look forward to the time when we can see one another again. And in my gratitude, I also echo the, the greetings and thanks to the Kalapuya peoples in whose territory we um, are remotely meeting um, this evening. And to remember that we owe a debt of land and history, land care and, and, and wisdom. I also want to, of course, acknowledge the context of, of this moment and why we are meeting from our living rooms instead of together um, with, with hugs and embraces and, and lots of conversation together. I'm really sorry not to see my Oregon friends um, and not, sorry not to see the Mackenzie and I look forward to the next time I can come back. And of course, the talk that I wrote to give to you in March Seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? It's like another world ago in March. And I pretty much had to throw it out and start all over again um, happily because this is a time of learning and unlearning together. And so tonight I will share a little bit of reading with you from older um, work that I think it fits the, the occasion, some newer work, and to try to spur some conversation together about the issues that we face together. And one of the first things I wanted to think about together is language and the shorthand for the circumstances, of course, that are keeping us apart, some people call lockdown. And the language that we choose to use, I think, is really important. Um, we could choose to think of this circumstance as the pandemic lockdown, something that's imposed by authorities, which entails restrictions and deprivations and, and some fear, but we could also choose to reframe that with what I think of as the more loving perspective, the language of shelter in place and recognize how our places, and by that I mean our social places as well as our ecological homes, how our places shelter us, how they care for us. And with gratitude, we recognize that we are sheltered in turn by our places. And in reciprocity, we shelter our places. And tonight we celebrate that land trusts and land stewardship workers cultivate this practice of the mutual sheltering of, of people and, and place. And I want with all of you to, to raise a glass to land trusts, to land caretakers, a glass of pure, water. And I suspect that the water that I drink here from my well in Fabius once ran down the Mackenzie and, and your waters fall here as well. 
thank you for asking me to join you back in, in March and, and now. And of course, I simply couldn't say no. Uh, why would I want to? <laughs> Both for my love of Oregon and the whole Mackenzie watershed, but also because in my culture, women have responsibility to speak for the water. Women and water have a special affinity as we both are um, life givers, nurturing life. And as life givers, women carry water within us, with our babies. And each of you listening tonight was born, of course, from water. We are governed by our grandmother, the moon, who has the power to move the waters of the world and to move the waters within us. And that same water allows, of course, the plants to grow, the animals to drink, the rivers to flow. And I see in the title of your event of Upstream, I like this title, Conversations Between People and Rivers. And indeed, women, particularly Indigenous women, are always in conversation with rivers. Our responsibility for water applies to water in all of its forms. Um, even maple sap, wild rice stands, springs. We say, of course, that water is life. And the nature of the conversation between people and rivers is perhaps hinted at in the number and the diversity of words that in our language we have for all aspects of water. Beautiful words in our language for water. Mbish, nibi, zibi. There are so many water words. I want to share just a little about this with you. You know, the water dipped from the rapids has a different name than the water that comes from the still pools. The words describing the ways of rivers in our language are not nouns. They're verbs. They're verbs. There's a verb for a river going around a bend. There's a verb for a river becoming a waterfall, for trickling, for shining in the sun, for being rippled by wind. And the conversation between our people and water is verb-based because water is understood as a living being with the capacity to act and change. And in English, of course, water is a noun. Um, water is material, sometimes thought of as a natural resource, um, sometimes as a thing. But in Potawatomi, water is alive. In fact, in our words for water, nibi, and the river, zibi, we hear that B sound, and it's a sound that actually stands for life. And indigenous women all over Turtle Island stand as protectors of water, from our sisters along the Penobscot River to the Bad River Sloughs in northern Wisconsin, to Standing Rock, and to the Klamath, and to the Willamette and the Mackenzie. Water is understood not only as a living being, but as a sacred entity, a spiritual being. And like every being, water comes from our mother's body, literally rising from the body of Mother Earth. And water is understood as her life blood that she then shares with every other living being. So this conversation between people and rivers always is one of respect and gratitude. And in this spirit, I, I offer my gratitude and my respect to your river, to the Mackenzie. And I hear in your land trust description of the Mackenzie as the living river, this notion of, of the aliveness, the verbness of, of the river. And this is perhaps our shared understanding um, of that nibi bamadizi when that water is is life. I want to reflect just for a moment about the first time I visited the Mackenzie, and I was trying to think of when it was. It was probably 20 years ago, and I've been back many times, but every time I go, it feels new, and I'm just awestruck. But the very first time that I visited the Mackenzie was a really slow trip because around every bend, I kept trying to pull over off the side of the road just to look. I wanted to listen to that 
rush and that sound of the cobbles moving in the water. I wanted to freeze my feet until they throbbed. And I thought particularly at the time that I nearly got rear-ended when I stopped to watch salmon um, jumping up a riffle. And at that moment, I thought, I should have a bumper sticker that says, I break for salmon. And sure enough, later that same day, I saw that you already have one. Um, I am, of course, from the great northeastern forest, another place with a wealth of water. Um, our hills run with brooks and streams and cricks and creeks and rivers from the tiniest vernal pools in the spring to bogs, spens, marshes, swamps and lakes everywhere, lakes carpets of dew all summer long, autumnal fog, snow, frozen waterfalls, and the deep silent ice. I can drink from the little spring behind my hill, beneath my hill, I should say. And I tell you all of this because I love water in all of the ways that you can, but none of this prepared me for Saheli Falls the whole body sensation of which I will not attempt to describe, and I know I don't need to, because you already know. Standing on the bank, a step from the flow of every color that water could be was there, that pounding power that vibrates the water, water in your own body. It feels like your, your cells are in call and response to the, to the river, um, calling you to join the flow. Um, the rainbows, the mossy walls, every tree dripping, this enveloping spray. I was soaked to the skin. It was as if there was no sensation except for water and this erasure of self so complete that you just know yourself as water. And when I could finally step away from the magnetic pull of the river and the falls, I remember saying to myself, this must be the place where water was born. And your invitation to speak with you tonight in celebration of the Mackenzie brought all of that back for me and made me ask and really reflect, how are we called to be when we know ourselves to be guests in the home of water, the place where water was born? How do we live when we are the guests in the home of water? And our first responsibility as a guest, of course, is gratitude, which is so much more than a polite thank you. I mean the kind of radical gratitude. I mean the kind of gratitude in which we acknowledge that our very existence, our lives are contingent upon the gifts of other lives. The kind of gratitude that arrests your taking any more because you know that you already have everything that you need. That's radical gratitude. The kind of gratitude that opens the door to reciprocity to wanting to give a gift in return. How to be a guest in the home of water. The first, the second thing after gratitude that came to mind for me was pay attention. Pay attention to where you are, to what the water is telling you. The, invest, the investment of attention is the gateway to knowing your host and attention demonstrates respect for their ways. You pay attention and learn the house rules. If you're a guest in the home of water or anywhere, you don't go rummaging through the cupboards helping yourself. You don't eat the last piece of pie in the fridge or track mud in the house, and put your feet up on the couch like you owned the place. You take care of it like it was your own. And you don't come as a guest to the home of water and impose your own ways. Changing its name, straightening a channel here and there, damming it up as you please, kicking out the people who already live there and inviting your friends to move in. The Mackenzie River Land Trust exemplifies this ethic of paying attention to place and to the rules of that place, to the ethic of what the river needs 
and the growing respect for the sovereignty and personhood of a river. And Joe asked me to talk about this upstream theme that you are wisely embracing. And this notion also took me back upstream. And on the theme of attention, I want to share a piece written from way, way upstream in the Mackenzie. After a week spent on Lookout Creek at the Andrews Experimental Forest as a writer in residence in the Long-Term Ecological Reflections Program, which if you don't know about it, and I know some of you sure do and have participated in it, um, it's a writing project designed to last for 200 years, to be a response, a humanistic response to that amazing landscape. It begins so high in the Mackenzie watershed, and this piece that I'll read to you from Braiding Sweetgrass, just a piece of it, of that chapter, um, begins with drops of, of rain. It comes from a piece called um, Witness to Rain. And I especially wanted to read this, knowing that we are all sitting inside, staring at a screen, when what we love is the world outside us. It's where we would mostly all rather be. And um, so let's together um, go outside. Let's go out into, a, um, into the forest and share a moment of paying attention to place. Witness to the rain. This Oregon rain at the start of winter falls steadily in sheets of gray. Falling unimpeded, it makes a gentle hiss. You'd think that rain falls equally over the land, but it doesn't. The rhythm and the tempo change markedly from place to place. Standing in a tangle of salal and Oregon grape, the rain strikes a rat-a-tat-tat on the hard, shiny leaves. It's like a snare drum of sclerophylls. Rhododendron leaves, broad and flat, receive the rain with a smack that makes the leaf bounce and rebound, dancing in the downpour. Beneath this massive hemlock, the drops are fewer, and the craggy trunk knows rain as dribbles down its furrows. On bare soil, the rain splats on the clay, while fir needles swallow it up with an audible gulp. Most other places I know, water is a discrete entity. It's hemmed in by well-defined boundaries, lake shores, stream banks, or the great rocky coastline. You can stand at its edge and say, this is water. And over here, this is land. But here in these misty forests, those edges seem to blur. Water doesn't seem to make a clear distinction between gaseous phase and liquid. The air merely touches a leaf or a tendril of my hair and suddenly a drop appears. After hours in the penetrating rain, I am damp and chilled. I could so easily retreat to tea and dry clothes, but I can't pull myself away. However alluring the thought of warmth, there is no substitute for standing in the rain to waken every sense senses that are muted within four walls, where my attention would be on me instead of all that is more than me. Here in the rainforest, I don't want to just be a witness to rain. I want to be part of the downpour, to be soaked along with the dark humus that squishes underfoot. I wish that I could stand like a shaggy cedar with rain seeping into my bark, that water could dissolve the barrier between us. I want to feel what they feel. I want to know what they know. But I am not a cedar, and I am cold. Surely there are places where the warm-blooded among us can take refuge, niches here and there where the rain doesn't reach. So I try to think like a squirrel and find them. A giant log blocks the trail. It has fallen from the tow slope out into the river where its branches drag in the rising current. Its top rests on the opposite shore. Going under looks easier than going over, so I dropped my hands and knees. 
and here I find my dry place. The ground mosses here are brown and dry, the soil soft and powdery. The log makes a roof overhead more than a meter wide in the wedge-shaped space where the slope falls away to the stream. I can stretch out my legs, the slope angle perfectly accommodating the length of my back. I let my head rest in a dry nest of hylocomium moss and sigh in contentment. My breath forms a cloud above me, up where brown tufts of moss still cling to the furrowed bark, embroidered with spider webs and wisps of lichen that haven't seen the sun since this tree became a log. This log, inches above my face, weighs many tons, all that keeps it from seeking its natural angle of repose upon my chest is a hinge of fractured wood at the stump and cracked branches propped on the other side of the stream. It could loose those bonds at any moment, and one day it will. But given the fast tempo of raindrops and the slow tempo of tree falls, I feel safe in the moment. The pace of my resting and the pace of its falling run on different clocks. Time as objective reality has never made much sense to me. It's only what happens that matters. How can minutes and years, devices of our own creation, mean the same thing to gnats and to cedars? 200 years is young for the trees whose tops this morning are hung with mist. It's an eye blink of time for the river and nothing, nothing at all for the rocks. The rocks and the river and these very same trees will likely be here in another 200 years, if we take good care. As for me and that chipmunk and the cloud of gnats milling in a shaft of sunlight, we will have moved on. If there's meaning in the past and in the imagined future, it's captured in the moment. And when you have all the time in the world, you can spend it, not on going somewhere, but on being where you are. So I stretch out, close my eyes, and listen to the rain. The cushiony moss keeps me warm and dry, and I roll over on my elbow to look out onto the wet world. The drops fall heavily on a patch of Nyam insigni, right at eye level. This moss stands upright, nearly two inches tall. The leaves are broad and rounded, like a fig tree in miniature. One leaf among many draws my eye by its long tapered tip, so unlike the rounded edges of all of the other leaves. And as I lean in closer, my head lines up with the drip line of the log and drips trickle down my neck, but no matter. The thread-like tip of this one leaf is moving, animated in a most unplant-like fashion. The thread seems firmly anchored to the apex of the moss leaf, an extension of its pellucid green. But the tip is circling and waving in the air as if it is searching for something. Its motion reminds me of the way inchworms will rise up on their hind sucker feet and, and wave their long bodies about until they encounter the adjacent twig to which they then attach their forelegs, release the back and arch across the gulf of empty space. But this is no many legged caterpillar. It is a shiny green filament, like a moss thread lit from within like a fiber optic element. As I watch, the wandering thread touches upon a leaf just millimeters away. It seems to tap several times at the new leaf. And then as if reassured, it stretches itself out across the gap. It holds like a taut green cable, more than doubling its initial length. And for just a moment, the two mosses are bridged 
by the shining green thread. And then green light flows like a river across the bridge and vanishes, lost in the greenness of the moss. Is that not grace? To see an animal made of green light and water, a mere thread of a being who just like me has gone walking in the rain. Witness to rain. Together this evening, we convene in gratitude to celebrate that land trusts look out for all of them, the moss, the river, the log, the spider, the green thread animal, helping to keep the house intact for whoever lives there and whatever other guests might arise. Another good rule we know for being a good guest is of course to clean up after yourself. After the feast, you better head to the kitchen to do the dishes. And I like to think about ecological restoration as doing dishes in Mother Earth's kitchen. Put your hands in the dirt to heal the land back to wholeness. And of course, our restoration work is often not just to clean up our own messes, but to clean up those that were left behind by others. And if we consider this upstream, downstream nature of a river to include upstream, downstream in time, as Joe suggested, restoration feels very much to me like a gift from we in the upstream to our downstream descendants. Restoration feels like being a good ancestor. And I send you gratitude for your restoration work at Green Island and, and elsewhere. It's very exciting work. And you know, when we do restoration work of a river and of land, um, the folks that we work with probably have really different conceptions of the work based on what their conceptions of land is. What does, what does land mean? And for many, in the, in the strict utilitarian sense, in the Western science framework of, of, of land, land is often understood primarily as property, right? Um, sometimes we think about land as natural resources and oftentimes as, as capital. And if this is our definition of land, of capital, property, and natural resources, um, we restore ecosystem structure and function um, in order to, in a sense, preserve a natural asset, to preserve natural capital and to maintain ecological integrity. Good things, good work. But I imagine that your definition of land is more expansive. You might stop for just a moment and think about even one word that is, is, what, what, is what is land? What do we mean by that? Um, sometimes land as, as biodiversity, the home of our, our more than human relatives, as aesthetics, as, as a source for recreation, as ecosystem services, as, as love. How do you restore that? And I'd ask you to expand even further into the indigenous worldview, where there are more, even more diverse meanings of what land is, where land is understood as our teacher, where land is the library, it's our pharmacy, it's the sacred landscape that's imbued with spirit, it's the home of our more than human relatives, it's our connection to our ancestors and to our descendants. Land is very much for Native peoples a source of our identity. It is the source of our language. In Potawatomi, we say that our language is a, is, is a sacred entity that came from spirit and from the land. We think about land not as this place for which we have property rights, but a place to whom we have moral responsibility for, for caretaking. And so if that's what land is, the, rest are, the definition of restoration becomes so much bigger than restoring ecosystem structure and function. We restore relationship. We move from ecosystem restoration to what I call reciprocal restoration. 
in which we're caring for the land means caring for the land-based cultures at the same time. When we restore the land, we restore ourselves. And as we celebrate the restoration work of the McKenzie Trust and all of the partners with whom you work, I know that both land and people will be grateful for that. Restoration work brings people and place back into mutual relationship, which is healing for, for both, and spurs the imagination of what truly reciprocal restoration might look like. And a good guest visiting in the home of water, maybe after a good meal, sitting on the back porch, watching the river go by and the sun go down, reminds me that one of the other responsibilities of a good guest is to bring a story along. Bring a story from your home place. And so I'd like to do that. I want to bring you a story from far, far upstream in time. A story from the lands where I live here on the ancestral territories of the Onondaga Nation in the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, and I think this particular story has deep resonance for the downstream time in which we are imagining. And, um, you know, as river people, um, we are accustomed to rivers flowing downstream, of course, right? But in part of this ancient Haudenosaunee story, that was not always the case. There was a time when the rivers ran both ways. Did you know that? Um, there's a rightness to it. It feels to me in this time of massive learning and unlearning that we are living together in mythic times when very powerful forces are holding us poised on the edge of a cliff with the potential for catastrophe and the potential for salvation hanging in the balance. And that's where this story comes from. It's a story that has lasted for thousands of years. It is both ancient and urgent. And it was shared with me by a Haudenosaunee elder, Tom Porter, when he was sitting at his table at his home in Ganajohalege, and he pulled out this deerskin bag of peach stones. And he told me about the time when Sky Woman's grandsons, the twins, were in conflict over the future of the beautiful world. A precipice again. And I asked him if I might share this teaching. And he kindly, agreed. And so that's what I would like to share with you a bit of tonight. And part of this is from some um, new writing as well. This fragment of the story is part of the Haudenosaunee creation story and has elements which also appear in our Potawatomi tellings of the origin of the world. And because many of you have read Braiding Sweetgrass, you'll remember that creation story of Sky Woman. Let me just invoke a tiny bit of that. You'll remember how Sky Woman fell to the earth from her home in the sky world, how she was rescued in midair by wild geese who set her to rest on the back of the snapping turtle, how the water beings brought up mud from the depths to make her a home on the back of the turtle, and I don't have time tonight to tell you that whole saga, but perhaps you also know that Sky Woman did not come here alone because she was pregnant with her daughter Winona, who was the first child born on Turtle Island. And this is where we pick up the thread of Tom's story. For when Winona grew to womanhood and the west wind sought her out, she became pregnant with twin boys. And those two babies are known by the names Flint and Sapling. And even in their mother's womb, those boys were in competition with each other. It was after all crowded in there and Flint wanted to get free. Sapling counseled him that he had to wait, he had to bide his time, that there was a natural way by which they would come into the world. But Flint was impatient and angry with his confinement. And so, as his name implies, he decided to cut his way out of his mother's womb 
rather than wait for natural birth. The result, of course, was the death of his mother, Winona. And so the two boys were orphaned and then raised by their grandmother, the Sky Woman, who did her best to guide them. And those boys had the responsibility of shaping this new world on Turtle's back. And they went about it very differently according to their two flint and sapling natures. Uh, gentle sapling intended to make life good for the humans who they knew were to follow them. And so he made things like delicious blackberry bushes for the use of the people to come. But Flint, however, came behind and put sharp thorns all over the bushes, ruining them. Sapling knew that the rivers would become the highways for the people in their jiman, in their canoes. And so he thoughtfully made the rivers run in both directions, upstream and downstream, so that people would never have to paddle upstream. But Flint came along and undid his handiwork, so the rivers always run downstream, and we have to paddle our way hard upstream. We see their handiwork even in the maple trees. Sapling gave the trees of, uh, of the gift of making sweet maple syrup that would run thick and brown right out of the trees. But Flint thought that that was going to make life far too easy for the people to come. So he went to the river and he poured buckets of water into the tops of the trees. So today the sap flows thin and, and clear and the people have to work really hard to turn it into syrup. These stories go on, but you see the pattern. And the two boys are not characterized as good and evil twin, as we might think of them in, the, in a Western framework. Um, but that judgment really isn't made. They simply represent opposing forces at work in the world that is constantly changing. And they are the forces, of course, of creation and destruction, which together make the world. The boys struggled between these forces. They competed, they did work, they undid each other's work, and eventually, it was decided that this competition had to end. And this uh, decision between creation and destruction was going to be decided in a game. And to decide the fate of the world, they decided to match their skills at what we know today as the peach stone game. The players use a set of so-called stones, which are often peach pits or plum stones. And one side of the seed has been painted white and the other side is blackened. And the player shakes the bowl with the stones in it, tosses the stones into the air, and only when all of the stones have turned one way or the other would a winner be declared and the fate of life on earth decided. If all of the stones came up black, flint would prevail and destruction would be loosed upon the world. Should they all fall white, then the world would continue under the generous hand of creation. They played and played without a winner. They tossed the seeds for hours, back and forth, back and forth, and with every throw, two boys gambled with the future of the world. Would life continue as we know it, or would all be lost? It's such an ancient story and yet couldn't feel more contemporary as we are today gambling with the future of the earth and with the continuity of life. On and on they played all night until the glimmer of light at the eastern horizon warned them that the time was up. They could make only one more throw as the pink of dawn colored their faces. The stones flew into the air for the last time and began to clatter one by one into the bowl. The first one came up black and the next and the next. All the stones were black until there was only a single seed still hanging in the air, tumbling and spinning on its way to the bowl to join the others. 
all the other beings watched in terror as humans gambled with the continuation of life. And at the moment when all life hung in the balance, it is said that all the members of creation, the trees, the berries, the grasses, the birds, the four-legged, the many-legged, and the no-legged, all drew in their breaths as the last stone tumbled. And together, all of creation gave a mighty shout. And its force caused the human foolishness to be overruled. And the power of their voices turned that last stone over as it fell into the dish. The color of trillium blooming in spring, of mother's milk, of moonlit snow, the color of polar bears. I've tried to imagine the sound of that shout, the roars, the panting, the swishing of grasses. In my imagination, I feel rather than hear their voices, large and small. There would be chirps and hoots and buzzes, howls and flutters, scrapes, squeaks, leaf flutters, needle whispers, spine quivers, buds swelling, seeds bursting, roots pushing, spores popping, and the vibration of the membrane in the smallest microbe coalesced into a great wailing wind so cohesive in strength and direction that it stops the stone, spins it around, holds it poised in midair, and sets it down, life side up. I am longing to hear it. But more than that, in my heart of hearts, I want to know what it is that propels the mighty shout. I want a word like an incantation. If we knew the name of a force for ongoing life, could we call it forth? It is no mistake that Flint and Sapling are twins, for the forces of creation and destruction are inextricably linked. Creation in the natural world begets opportunities for destruction, and destruction clears the way for creativity. The boys wrestled and rolled about in the dirt as boys will do, making the world around them. But the erupting volcano destroys the forest and blocks the river and meadows of wildflowers follow the ash. In this time, when men again are gambling with the future of the world and the stones are again suspended in mid-fall, it is wise to ask, before they clatter to the bottom of the bowl in a portent. What is it that needs to be destroyed so that creation can flourish? Some people might think it's one species that needs to be deleted. And the destructive power of humans is undeniable, but I'm not sure it's humans that need to go extinct, but human exceptionalism. About 500 years ago, a little more, we began an unwitting experiment in this society. We abandoned the understanding of the personhood of all beings for a hierarchy of being in which humans are perched squarely on the pinnacle of creation, just below the angels, with all our sustainers below us. They're not as our family, but as our property. In this experiment with human exceptionalism, we tested what would happen if we thought ourselves to be masters of the universe, and not, as my Haudenosaunee neighbors say, the younger brothers of creation. And we know the results of that experiment are in. The two sides of the peach stones for me that will decide our future our human exceptionalism on one side and the inverse, kinship. Whether we choose to listen to the mighty shout or go on as usual with our hands over our ears. Now I have argued this evening that human exceptionalism is the root of environmental destruction, the othering 
and diminishment of the other non-human citizens, the privileging of human needs above all else. And in this historic moment of upheaval and learning, we have to recognize that human exceptionalism comes from the same root as white exceptionalism. The notion not only that one species, but one race has greater rights to the wealth and beauty of the world than another. All of these issues are connected. Racism and environmental degradation are so tightly coupled in the same worldview as a failure to recognize one another as kin. The land trust movement has with wisdom and foresight extended its mission from the core value it began with of land protection to restoration, to healing of land and relationship to land, through social engagement, through education, for reconnection to nature. And the work of this healing continues to expand. And I was really heartened to see the statement from the Land Trust Alliance reaffirming the goal of creating a land conservation community that embraces diversity and rejects systemic racism. I am reminded by a friend of mine, Kathleen Dean Moore, who shared with me this quote um, of, that comes from Thomas Merton that says, someone will say, you only care about birds. Why not worry about people? I worry about both birds and people. We are in the world and part of it, and we are destroying everything because we are destroying ourselves spiritually, morally, and in every way. It's all part of the same sickness. I want to end with the reflection that land trust work is also justice work. We give of ourselves in order to protect, to shelter our place, so that the non-human citizens of this place can live to fullness, giving their gifts to the living community. And with the same conviction, we also act on behalf of our human relations, oppressed members of our own species, impelled by the same desire that gave rise to the mighty shout, the desire to live one's life. In the spirit of justice, I want to close this evening with a reflection on a number. I wanted to celebrate with you all the number of acres that land trusts have collectively protected. So I went to look it up and I found the number 56 million acres. And for a moment, I was kind of confused because 56 million acres is a phrase that is always hovering in the back of my mind, but for a completely different reason. 56 million acres is the sum total of the land area of indigenous held lands in this country. 56 million acres. It's a tiny fraction, approximately really less than 2% of our original homelands on which we have the right to protect those lands, to steward those lands, to practice our culture there, to gather our foods and our medicines and conduct our ceremonies and speak our language. Beyond those 56 million acres, we are exiled from our own homelands. And those 56 million acres are called in Indian country, trust lands because they're held in trust for indigenous peoples by the federal government. And this trust lands is a legacy of paternalism and racism and oppression. The symmetry of the words trust lands and land trusts, both 56 million acres, was arresting to me. 56 million acres is a tiny fragment and the recognition that every single acre of land, public land and private land, protected land and land vulnerable to exploitation is in fact indigenous homelands. How do we in the land conservation movement address this reality? 
The other reality is that 56 million acres is both a big number to celebrate and a small number in the face of the pressures for exploitation. And in protecting land for its intrinsic and cultural values, there's tremendous potential for allyship between the caretakers of those acres. Is there not common cause with the very people whose original homelands are being protected? There's an opportunity to heal the original land taking wounds of colonialism through collaboration with indigenous peoples as the Mackenzie Trust is doing, I celebrate that. With the growing number of native land trusts through co-management, through cultural easements, as well as conservation easements, with reparations, reparations, with return of land to original peoples. Some of this work is modeled in the work of um, Beth Rose Middleton in cultural conservation and Peter Forbes' work, um, who I think are real heroes um, in, this, in this movement. And I'm, I'm thinking of the great Toni Morrison's charge to us, if you have power, she says, if you have power, then empower someone else. The skills and resources that we have as land trusts, as land conservation practitioners, could also be used to serve land justice for Indigenous peoples and for other oppressed peoples denied access to living landscapes. And I'm so heartened to learn that these questions have been on your agenda for a long time and are germinating as, as we speak. And I challenge you, as all of us, um, to rewrite the rules, modeled perhaps on the rules for being a guest in the house made of water. All gratitude to land stewards behaving as guests in the homes of Indigenous peoples. Pay attention. Give gratitude and respect. Observe the rules respect the sovereignty of your host, and give a gift in return. I think of the words of my teacher, the late Audrey Shenandoah of Onondaga Nation. And she said, we seek justice, not only for ourselves, but justice for all creation. In all the richness of that story of the mighty shout, there is one more detail that I cherish, that the game was played not with stones or bones or shells, but with seeds. The power of seeds is to carry the green fire through times of hardship. The lesson of seeds is that whatever will flourish in the future, downstream, is carried in a seed, the makers of continuity. Whatever you want to see on the other side of this bottleneck of climate change, of extinction, of societal transformation, whatever you want to see on the other side has to be carried through to save the seeds, to protect the seeds, pass them from hand to hand. We don't make them, but we can build good soil in which those seeds can grow. That is our responsibility to the future, our gift from upstream to downstream. In closing, I can say only for myself, as I watch that last peach stone hang in the air, caught between the forces of creation and destruction, of despair and of hope, that I will stand beside you and together we can add our voices to the mighty shout so that when the last seed falls, it will land on good soil. Me you, me quetch. Thank you. It deserves, if anything, just a, a, a few more moments of silence. Uh, thank you, Robin. Thank you, Tana, also for being here. Um, 
to folks that may have arrived after I began explaining uh, some of the evening, fr from now we have another 20, 30 minutes maybe of question and answer among Robin and, and Tana and myself. And we've requested that people submit their questions through the Q&A tab down below. Um, I noticed there have been a number of hand raises. We won't be calling on people through the hand raise, but if you, if you have a question, great. They're starting to roll in now. And again, we'll try to, to get to a range of things as we can. I think the first question that came in from Tana Shepard is a great one to begin with. Um, I'll read it first. Thank you, Robin. Uh, your book and wisdom has stayed with me and changed me. I will be ever grateful. Wondering how you would consider, uh, uh, are you considering a young reader version of braiding sweet glass, sweetgrass as a climate education teacher? I would welcome and use it as a resource in my teaching. If it's okay, I would really appreciate the both of you expanding that a little bit because Tana, your work with youth and youth education, um, not only a, a specific resource like your book, but quite frankly, how do you take this work and get and keep the attention of youth um, that are um, invited into a world of marvelous distraction right now? Yeah, first of all, for the beginning of that question, I would say, yes, I've been approached by lots of teachers who are asking for um, a, a children's version, particularly about the honorable harvest mm -hmm. and reciprocity. And um, I, I, I would like to make that happen. Um, but yes, I, I think that more broadly, the, the notion of, 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 of youth education, I'm really excited to hear what you've been doing, Tana. Um, through our Center for Native Peoples in the Environment, we run a Native Earth Youth Camp um, in the summer, um, which is um, designed to bring together um, both uh, traditional ecological knowledge and, and, and Western science, and to really highlight teachings, but they're teachings on the land. And, and to me, that's the antidote to the digital distractions that you're referencing, Joe. Um, heck, there's nothing more exciting than, you know, being in the river and then, you know, being muddy and watching caterpillars. So I, I don't, once kids um, see those things and feel those things, I think they put their phones aside. What do you think, Tana? Is that your experience? Absolutely. So my, my experience has been um, more specifically with tribal youth programs and um, the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, as well as the Klamath tribes and Klamath River tribes have had um, tribal salmon camps that I've participated in as a coordinator of. And it's kind of a combination of not just being on the land, but also having access to um, the people who can talk about the space. And so it's connecting youth back to their homelands because some of them live on their reservation communities and others don't. Um, learning not only the stories, but their connection to, to those plants and animals, learning about seasonal rounds, learning songs, meeting with elders, connecting with um, the tribal scientists so that they can understand that being a scientist is not wearing a white lab coat and being in a lab somewhere, but it can also be like playing in a stream somewhere and counting fish um, and that it, it's fun and it's interactive and and having it connected to to ceremony as well um, but for all youth um, in Oregon there it's a really exciting and unique time because um, the Oregon Department of Education has been working with the tribes in Oregon to develop curriculum and I know that um, they have been working on curriculum regarding first foods and so those things will be rolling out and be available for teachers to access in their science curriculum. Oh, that's wonderful. That's great. Yeah. Well, and, and as you said so well, you know, connecting culture and ceremony to place in strengthening identity and, um, and it strengthens an appreciation of, of, of cultural stories. I'm remembering being in the woods where with, um, again, with tribal youth and we're, we heard a hermit thrush singing. It's so we're, we're all listening and loving that sound. And one of the young kids said, wait, hermit thrushes are real? Um, and he'd always heard about them in ceremony and in, in story, but he didn't know of their physical reality. 
in the world because he had grown up in a in an urban setting disconnected from land and this just the sound of that bird um and its connection to story um you could see something grow in him so powerful um was I mean, that's those are the kinds of real whole connections that we want to foster nice thank you there's a question about the stack of books on the shelf behind you, Robin. Um, someone's asking, what, besides your Can own I read, <laughs> <laughs> just looking for recommendations, besides your own wonderful work, who do you read? Who do you find inspiration in these days? What books or writers do you recommend? Oh, wow, what a great question. Um, I am a great fan of Louise Erdrich. I've been most recently, um, uh, uh, embedded in, in her wonderful storytelling. Um, um, so I certainly find inspiration in, in her storytelling. Um, for me, one of the most inspirational writers, it will not be a stranger um, to you all in Oregon, and I would say that that's Kathleen Dean Moore. Um, I am always inspired by, by the power and the honesty and the clarity of, of, of her words. Um, um, but otherwise, you can read my bookshelf behind me. <laughs> it's a little too small. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. How about you, Tana? Well, I echo Robin on uh, Louise Erdrich. She is my top favorite author of all time. Um, but I, again, an Oregon author is um, um, Liz Woody. Yeah. She's also a, a, a great um connector of stories um, and she's from Warm Springs and so has has connections in the Willamette Valley as well. Nice. Tana, you head up an emerging network, the Willamette River Network. And we've, we've got a question about networks. Um, many of us are, are working um, at the really rich but sometimes challenging work of networks and this question is what can a new environmentally focused network organization Due to center reciprocity and traditional values and knowledge amidst a sea of white dominant organizations? That's a great question. Um, and we're learning as we go. Um, but I think we're we're moving slowly. We're not we're not looking at um, you know, we have to complete this benchmark by this time and by that time and stuff. So we're, we're looking at establishing relationship first with communities, um, communities that were part. So, so our network is, is born out of an initiative that Meyer Memorial Trust had for the last decade. Um, and it was called the Willamette River Initiative. And so it has a lot of folks throughout the Willamette Basin who, um, who have been engaged in this work, but the last three or four years, um, Meyer Memorial Trust also started investing in um, communities of color and, and diversifying the work that they do. And, and as such, the initiative started to implement that into their work as well. And so we have newer groups and, and communities that haven't always been part of the conversation joining. And we know that that's not complete. And so part of it is also just reaching out to communities that haven't always been part of the conversation and developing relationship and asking what are the needs. So we're doing a lot of listening. Um, we're also in um, conversation right now with our board talking about how to involve um, elders because we have a huge focus on youth, but we also want to be intergenerational in that knowledge transfer as well. So. Um, you know, we're, we're taking our time. We're trying not to um, adhere to a really strict schedule. Um, we want it to be authentic and, and to be real and lasting. And um, that's only going to happen through relationship. And it's going to look really weird <laughs> right now in these times where we're, we're doing a lot of our connecting in this way, in this virtual space. Um, but we're hopeful that someday soon we can start connecting with folks in person and um, having an opportunity to have everybody in the same space together. Yeah. Robin, I know you've done a lot of work. You mentioned Peter Forbes, um, and I think some of the, 
the networking and collaborative work that you've been involved with there or else that's what came to mind for me but um, are there other experiences from which you've gained hope yes um and in this notion of the kinds of leadership that are needed against this sea of other organizations you know to address that same question um one of the things that i think is really important and is and, and tana really exemplified in the answer by saying well we want to focus on intergenerational um work we want to listen is i'm reminded of the work the words of um Oren Lyons, the wonderful um, indigenous activist, leader, philosopher, um, who said really that our work together is, is I think the, the four words that he uses are values change for survival. That the thing that we really need to focus on is, is changing, or not changing, but strengthening minds and hearts around values and that everything else follows from that. And he highlights these, these values that um, are, are inherent, he, he would call them indigenous values of things like intergenerational respect, continuity, seven generations, thinking. Um, but he also acknowledges, as we all do, that these are values that come from um, being taught by the land, from thinking about the land as, as, as um, a living being that we pass on to the next generation. So I think that that's what can set Indigenous-led organizations apart, is, is the guidance by, um, by those values. Thank you. Someone's asking all of us, what do you, Robin, Tana, Joe, suspect is the root of this sickness of which Robin spoke, and how does that weave into the work of the trust? But um, I'll uh, please, Robin, if you want to start. D deep roots, um, what comes it, to mind? Well, in the roots, I think of this of, I would call it a failure of kinship, you know, that this, this, this notion of the, of othering all the rest of the world, um, uh, that gives us the, the, uh, we think it gives us permission to exploit the rest of the world because we think that we're the only ones who are beings. I think that this, um, the notion of extending personhood to all beings, including rivers and trees and fish and little green thread animals is, is um, one of those values um, of the personhood of, of all beings and, and, and kinship. Um, and so if, you, if the question is, how did we lose that? How did we lose that? Um, there are lots of, of scholars who think about these sorts of things. One of the places is, is to think about um, uh, the origin of, of some of the dominant Western religions that, that took people out of place and put divinity up in the sky rather than in the land. Um, it divorced people from the spirituality of, of all the, and the lessons, the teachings of all the beings who were around us. Um, I think that's certainly a contributing factor. What do you think, Tana? You know, I always, um, when I was an undergrad, um, was fortunate enough to have um, a native doctoral student who was studying indigenous philosophy as a friend. And um, she took very... Um, special times to, to sit with me and a few other undergrads and teach us about Descartes. And she talked about um, how when you separate humans from all other beings and from the land and everything that um, essentially um, you're creating fear and a, a want to control and um, that disconnect happens. And, and so I always, I always think about Cartesian thought when I, when I look at Western worldviews and um, how, how different they are from a lot of indigenous um, 
perspectives. And, and it's been the, the easiest and clearest way to like, you know, separate out what's valued and what's not or how it's valued or it's monetized. Yeah, that, that concept of control is one that we at the McKenzie River Trust and like the land trust community, the conservation community is grappling with because we are in a privileged place in a system that um, allows for property designation and control and in the United States, especially the, the sense that I am, I have rights associated with this, with this property. And for me, one of the things that, um, you know, coming at this from the biological animal behavior side of things, there is a growing recognition of the psychology that, that drives us and that power, that uh, the feeling of power how deeply rooted that is in our psyche and how that has been given such free reign in so many ways. We, we try to find ways that our work on, on the ground can A, give people and place an opportunity to slow down, slow the speed down, ease off on that power. And as you described in the, what was that, your second good rule of a, of a good guest, just observe and be there. Um, but it's, it's complicating now that we have turned the lens back on ourselves and see that, wow, even in how we restrict access to places or are, are, are asked to restrict what can be done and not done on a piece of property with good intention to, to, to care for some other thing but how intertwined that is and um, how, co how complex it is. It's a, it's a fascinating, frustrating, heartbreakingly complex system that we're working within now. Yeah, but ultimately rooted in who gets to be listened to and who gets to be a voice in those, in those decisions. And um, I, I very um, intentionally think about who um, in that much bigger sense of the who of all living beings. Um, and uh, again, those of you who've been reading Breeding Sweetgrass know this notion of the grammar of animacy. I suspect in, in your language, Tana, as well as in, in, in ours, um, we, you can't refer to living beings as, as, as objects. Um, right? Um, that's this grammar of, of animacy. And just the way that, that the English language, back to your question of origins of these, these ways of thinking, um, forces us to objectify a river or a tree. We can only call them it in, in the grammar of, of English. And that automatically sets everything else aside, this man and nature um, duality. And so it, it is encoded, those values are encoded in, in our language as, as, as well. Those are other reasons why a, a, a cross-cultural approach can be so powerful because it, you can shift your whole frame of reference by saying, wow, I never thought about the fact that English sort of gives you permission to um, objectify the world um, just by the language that you speak, so. We were in Montana last year at um, a state park where um, the treaty that ceded lands uh, in the Bitterit um, is acknowledged. And you dig in, I just happened to dig into some of that history and there was essentially one translator uh, responsible for several days of meetings and to think about the limitation of that difference in language and then to think of what was happening at the time then and it was falling on the shoulders of someone who in this case had been in the United States for maybe a, a decade and you see just the dominoes fall uh, and how, how far along now uh, things have toppled and how, then again how complex that is yeah one of the um, things I do and work with youth, with tribal youth specifically, is we, we do a lot of talking about belonging and citizenship, and specifically tribal citizenship, which has been a concept that's been imposed on our tribal nations, and most of it's tied to blood quantum. Mm -hmm. And um, 
we ask like all of these questions about, you know, like, well, what did you have to do to become a citizen of the United States? Well, they were born here, but if you weren't born here, what would you have to do? And like, you would have to know your history and you'd have to learn language and you'd have to follow laws and all of these things. And, um, and then we start talking about what is required of you as a tribal citizen and everything. But I love how Robin's work talks about not just being a citizen of a group of people, but a citizen of our environment and our world and our responsibilities and what the natural law is, which is how traditionally our tribal communities operated. And, um, and I, I, I love that um, way of thinking. And I, I hope that that's something that can be infused in larger, more um, dominant culture spaces. Nice. So th there's a question about um, how we can, wh wh what more can be done, what things can be done to make all, all people feel welcome, accepted and welcomed in nature, comfortable in nature. That's a, a huge question, of course, with lots of, um, lots of approaches to it. One of them that I think I would start off with is um, particularly relevant, I think, to the land trust world. Um, at our Center for Native Peoples and the Environment, we've been lately working with Land Trust, Nature Conservancy, and the state of New York um, on what we're calling restoration, to borrow Gary Nabhan's wonderful word, um, to say it's not enough just to restore a place, but to restore relationship to place. And much can be done with the, um, the narratives that are associated with protected lands. Um, how many of them are in the language of the homeland that they are in? Very few of them. Um, and how many of them in the signage and the narrative that protects that place um, talk about history as if it began with the pioneers who's, who put their fences there? Um, Restoration of really changing the narrative to say, whose land is this? Who are the hands that built these places? Um, um, what what is the real story? Um, is I think a, an important element to um, invitation to uh, participate in in this movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's also important to. I mean. Oregon has a really large like immigrant and refugee population now also and making sure that we have signage and accessibility for, for them as well um, to, to feel welcomed and, and to understand where they're at. Here's one I'm gonna read maybe more than once because it is rich. Can you model an effective response to the human exceptionalism ideology? It gives rise to the notion that reclaiming contemporary human spaces for the restoration of land, water, and original peoples would be immoral or unjust to the people who live there today. Shall I read that again? Yeah. <laughs> Can you model an effective response to the human exceptionalism ideology that gives rise to the notion that reclaiming contemporary human spaces for restoration of land, water, and original peoples would be immoral or unjust to the people who live there today? I'm trying to wrap my mind even around the, the question. Um, I, I think I don't understand the question well enough to answer it. I'm sorry. Tana, does it? I'm, I'm looking at the question in the Q&A box and I've read it a couple of times. Yeah. Um, I mean, my, my interpretation of it is that if we restore a space for its originally intended purposes of the people who were stewards of that space, that it would somehow be in, immoral or unjust to the people who live there today. 
And, and to me, like, that doesn't make sense that it would be immoral because that's what that space was intended for, first of all, um, and how it was cared for. So it would be a healing of that place more so than, than being, I don't, I don't understand how it could be immoral or unjust. I'll, I'll, I'll take a flyer on this one. I, I, my guess, and thanks Brett for the question and sorry, it can't be more interactive, but when I think about the Klamath now, and we saw the um, march uh, of angry current day farmers, uh, ranchers, who are concerned that uh, th this sort of attention to more water in stream is taking away their livelihoods. And how do you respond to that um, kind of a situation from the perspectives that we've talked about tonight? Um, it's, in, it's interesting to me because my experience uh, and observation in this work is oftentimes it's even difficult to have the, have the conversation, um, uh, to, to bring those, as you described earlier, those, those uh, differing values, different perspectives on value together to sit at the table and have the conversation. But uh, mm. curious, it's, um, it's real work right now. It's, it's a real challenge. And does, does that help maybe? And I'm sorry, Brett, if I misinterpreted uh, your question. I think, thank you for that, that clarification. Um, and I, I guess I would respond with an example from, from where I live. Um, the Onondaga Nation, whose, whose territories I, I am on, filed some years ago what they called the Land Rights Action. Um, it was the um, petition because of illegal land taking to for the restoration of ancestral title to their own homelands. And they couched that not in terms of a zero sum game of if we have this land, then you can't, um, that you're going to be kicked out of this land if we have Aboriginal title, the notion was exactly 10, as you, the words that you used, they said, well, this is for healing. This is for healing for our common future, that we all live here. We all need to drink that water. We all need the cultural and ecosystem services of that, of that, of that river. And, and natural law says that that's what the river was designed to do, was to nurture all those lives. Um, and so it, it, it's, I think, not, it doesn't have to be a competitive model. It can be a, a, a shared model um, that, that recognizes the, the claims of, 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 of all beings. But, you know, the river doesn't ask for your political party um, before it gives you a drink. And then I feel like that's how people should be too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Joe, you, you gave a very controversial um, example and I am clearly very biased on that sure. topic For good reason. because that's my home and and yeah. um but I I um when I when I think about the situation back there um we have not had access to salmon for over a century now because four dams have been put up along the Klamath River that prevent their passage and um the Lost River suckerfish, uh, we call chwam, um, has been on the endangered species list for a number of years now. And it's changed how we have ceremony. It changes our food systems. It's changed our health. Um, my granny doesn't eat fish. We're fish people. <laughs> I wasn't raised with fish. I grew up on deer and elk meat. Um, I love salmon. And with the prospect of, of dams coming down and um, the thought that, that my babies might get to be fish people, um, it, it's, it's so exciting to me that that could happen in my lifetime. Um, because my great grandmother, um, who, who lived up until my senior year of high school and lived down the street from me, remembered when there were salmon in the Sprague River, which is a tributary of the Klamath. And um, I, I just, I see that as our healing and, and stuff. My, my 
tribe has experienced a lot of trauma. We were the second tribe in the nation to be terminated and we lost the largest land um, out of any tribe that was terminated during that era. And when we were restored to federal recognition in 1986, we received no land base back. And all of that land is now in private hand, uh, private landowners or national forest. Um, where the Modoc War took place, Thule Lake no longer exists. It's farmland. Um, you can see pictures, like there were, it was a, during a time when photographs were actually taken, it wasn't drawings. You know, there, there are pictures of, of Thule Lake. And now when you look at it, it's farmland, but there's still not enough water. And so um, it's the high desert and we have, to, we have to acknowledge that. And it's also climate change and fire. fire. There was actually fires in the Klamath Marsh during that demonstration a couple of weeks ago. And it, it's, the, it's not even officially summer yet. So we have to be really conscious of what's happening in our environment and um, not continue to take and take because I know um, farming practices have become much more corporate where there are, it's no longer dry farming or drip irrigation. It's, it's three or four crops a season. Thank you. I just, I talked about um, the wonky, the clunkiness of this, and I'm, a, I'm very much a part of that. I, my, because my screen is what it is, I saw two or three questions when there are probably 15 or 20 lined up now. I'm sorry, we're not going to have a chance to, to spend time on um, many more. And I think probably it, given the timing and some follow up I want to do about the two events that we're trying to support, the two efforts we're trying to support. I'd love to take, um, if, you, if you don't mind, your comments on one more question. And I think this is a nice follow up to the discussion you just had. Um, the question is, first, thank you, Robin, for letting me talk. Um, interested in the concept, love the concept of being a good guest. What do you say to a bad guest? If a guest has been inconsiderate or destructive, is the guest shunned, thrown out? I think we need the rules for being a good host as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I think the, the first rule is, isn't, is education, is, is education. I don't, I don't think that, that banishment and throwing, throwing people out is the way to start, um, but to, to sit down and uh, talk about things. Um, and oftentimes, in my experience, let's say the bad behavior of guests, metaphorically speaking, often is out of ignorance and a, and a failure to, I was going to say to, to know history, to know the reality of other people's lives. Um, but that's not always just the failure of an individual. It's a failure of an educational system and the erasure of history and culture. Um, and so, I think that the first responsibility is is to um, is to share perspectives, um, and then you can banish them if they. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on that, Tana? Completely agree. Um, I, I think um, when when you're not from a place and you don't know the rules or you don't know what the protocol is for things, um, as a guest, it's our job to ask. Um, and if we don't ask and, and we mess up, then we can apologize and learn, learn how to act appropriately. Um, but we need teachers to, to tell us and guide us. And, um, but if, but if, we, if we know the rules and we blatantly um, ignore them, then by all means, go away. <laughs> Thank you both, um, I have to say considering how much bad behavior I've shown since 1984, Robin, when you reminded me that on the balds in Gatlinburg uh, in the Smoky Mountains, that not everyone wanted to hear people singing at the top of their lungs. Um, I really appreciate how much bad behavior has been tolerated uh, and how many opportunities were given to make amends and to learn. And uh, learning from both of you tonight 
and ongoing uh, is a treasure. And thank you for that. Really appreciate it. Um, a couple of things, folks. Uh, one, we will again uh, tomorrow send out an email with a link to the, this entire presentation. Um, and we will follow up on, um, we'll, we'll see what we can do with some of the additional questions. I think some people have made some requests for follow-up information, and I think some MRT staff have been directing, uh, responding to some of those. But it looks like we still have about 350 people on, and I, I greatly appreciate that. I, again, um, I'm glad to say that uh, with ticket sales and the donations that people were able to make when they bought tickets, uh, we've already brought in uh, more than $10,000 that we will be able to split between those two initiatives. Um, and that link that we shared earlier is live. It's something that we'll keep up all night and really want to encourage you. I mean, 300, 400 people that were here tonight. If you think that instead uh, back in March, you had gone out for dinner or maybe drinks or dessert before or after, uh, you know, the $20 that you, um, $20, $25 that you might spend then if donated to this would provide, if everyone did that, would provide another $10,000 um, that would be split again between this um, Tribal Fires Initiative and then the Juneteenth celebration that Escape Dance Academy is um, helping organize on Saturday. So thank you uh, again to both of you. Thank you for everyone in the, the virtual audience for tolerating this. Um, uh, the, the awkwardness. I have to say for about three seconds, I forgot. It was really nice to just have a conversation with the both of you. So um, with that, we'll wrap it up and wish you well. Thanks. <laughs>